Thanks everyone. My name is Beth Burton Cron and I'm running for council because I absolutely love this community to death. I'm a longtime community activist and I'm ready to take the plunge. I've lived here with my husband for 24 years and we've been raising our boys. I bring years of grassroots efforts to the community, a founding director of the Sewage Treatment Action Group, and co-founder, along with Allison Gall, of the Esquimalt Residents Association, of which Mark was a first-time board member of our group. Thank you, Mark. As we move forward, finally, on the sewage treatment project and the EVP and other issues that impact our community, I promise you that you, the residents, will be part of the planning process from the start. That has been the problem all along, and it won't be like that going forward. Council needs a mandate to be given by you for us to lead. So to that end, with the EVP, I promise right out of the gate to decide whether to lease, own, or sell it outright. Please vote for me on November 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the Chamber for hosting. My name is Linda Hungerby, and I'm seeking your vote for my fifth term of office as a Squamal Councillor. I am proud of the work that I have done in my, over my 12 years in office. I would be honored to continue representing my community using the knowledge and experience I have gained. I actively participate and am dependable and diligent in my efforts to understand the issues. I am respectful working cooperatively and collaboratively, and listening to all points of view. In making decisions, I consider all perspectives, legal, financial, environmental, and social, and I promise to continue the same. We have much work to do. Council needs the community to provide input on issues, and Council needs to listen. There will be lots of opportunities for the community to obtain information through agenda packages, and by attending meetings or watching on live stream video on Monday nights or afterwards at your leisure. To be continued. Good evening, my name is Tim Morrison. I'm currently serving my first term on council and asking for your support for a second term. I have a lot of experience involved in the community, having served as chair of the Spinal Red Association prior to being on council. I also have extensive professional experience, uh, many years in government communications. I've also been a teacher, a school trustee, a journalist, um, and a world traveler with experience in over 75 countries on six continents. But Esquimalt is my home. It's our home. And together we've endeared a lot over the last few years. Most notably, we've taken on the CRD on the sewage uh, issue, and we've won. Together, as a grassroots victory, we beat the CRD. And now moving forward, more importantly, we need to focus that same energy, that same engagement, that same grassroots, the Squamal way of doing things on our economic revitalization strategy. Squamal Council has a plan. We want to move forward. We want to bring in new investment. We want to bring in new quality business on, on Squamal Road. We want to bring a new vibrancy to our community for both residents and visitors. I offer you my proven experience. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Megan Brain and I'm running for re-election to council. And I'm running because I'm committed to our community and I believe it truly is the best place to live. I have lived in Esquimalt and I've owned and operated a business in Esquimalt for over two decades. My proudest moments are in my first term I spearheaded the youth engagement policy which allowed youth to be full voting members on all committees of council. When youth are engaged and part of the solution, they are much stronger and much more energized to be part of a community. In my second term, as you've already heard, sewage treatment was huge for us. And for, I think, an unprecedented time, I saw council and a community work together. It was so unprecedented that it surprised the entire region. Overall, I'm proud of the decisions I've made, and I do this because I love this community. I do it because I believe in being part of the solution, not just part of the problem. I am proud to be from Esquimalt. Both you can bring. I'll stand up, but I don't feel good. And I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> After hearing Councillor Morrison, Hodgkins, Mackay, and Chinbine, 
add an additional $2,000 a year to a very favorable independent committee report on compensation. I knew I had to run for the council. This was the second time since they were elected that they opened the bylaw for more compensation. I realized that there were more in this for the money than for the residents of the spy hall. I personally was not accepted at a compensation. After 20 years of being an activist and following council meetings and serving on council committees, I have found this been the most secret of councils. They have held more in-camera meetings and made it more difficult to get public information from staff. I cannot get a reply on what our CEO makes. The last financial report said she had a $15,000 raise. Her salary is now... Thank you, Rob. Oh, 178. <laughs> At my age, I can't see that far. Okay. So, 15 out of the 15 council candidates. David Trudeau, the LP candidate, was invited but chose not to attend tonight. So, here we go. Because this is sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce, they get the first question, but I'll have you to tell you this is a show of hands. Show of hands questions are really tough on candidates because they all want to tell you there's a gray area or there's or why. So, this is a tough one, starting you off. And, and it's, how many of you are in favor of offering a tax incentive or tax incentives to attract new businesses to a slime off. Just so it's clear, anyone here not in favor of that? <laughs> not yet, very much. One more short snap before we go. Adrian's gonna head out into the audience to be my spotter, so if you've got a question that you'd like to ask, we've got 28 here, so we're gonna have to work hard tonight, but we'll work together. If you've got a question, Adrian will come and stand next to you and I'll bring the microphone. While you're doing that, raise your hands if you've got a question. First one up, again, show of hands. Would you vote in favor of a motion to ban insured and licensed RVs from being parked on a homeowner's property? Insured and licensed is underlined here. Would anybody be in favor of that? Of banning, of a motion to ban insured and licensed from being parked on homeowner's property. Okay, there we go. First question from the audience. Who would like to have that on? Okay, Adrian's going to go there. Well, he's getting in position for that. We move to another one here. We'll start with narrow key candidates on this one. Many of you say you would move to the Slimehawk Village Project forward. How specifically would you do this? You can have that up to 60 seconds. We understand these are important issues, but please be frugal with your time. And the will start with you. Thank you. Uh, the village project uh, needs to be moved forward. We've done a lot of work in the past, so it's a matter of directing staff to get on with it and uh, what are the steps to go. There is a public process that has to occur, uh, but we do have uh, interest in from an anchor tenant. We have done many of the studies that need to be done. Uh, we do need to engage uh, an architect, uh, and we have to figure out how we're going to deal with the land. Are we going to sell it? Are we going to lease it? Are we going to do uh, public-private partnership? Those decisions have to be made. They would, uh, would occur within uh, the first quarter uh, in terms of starting that process. Thank you. Scott Echo, thank you. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in Esquimalt is that the permit process takes far too long. I've talked to many developers about this in depth, and they've told me that Esquimalt City Hall is one of the most difficult places to get a building permit. Um, as far as the village project, I'm not going to stop anything that's ongoing. Um, it would be nice if it was um, something that was going to create a livable space for everybody to walk and enjoy its formal along with some area for festivals but right in that area i believe is where this sewage treatment plant is supposed to go um, this idea of putting it in the downtown core of the next to city hall so i have a, a very large concern about that one of my biggest concerns and why i'm running from there to Swanwell. thank you very much for your time thank you john john so I think it's a question of uh, engaging architects and the designers right from the start. We live in a wonderful region where there are many talented uh, architects who can start a simultaneous process. I know there have been soil sample issues and remediation concerns, but I don't think that should have held up the project in terms of visioning it 
getting out, consulting the public uh, in the first place about what it should look like and working actively uh, with the anchor tenant, uh, who could be the Justice Institute of British Columbia. I would also like to take that a step further and look towards our military partners for a regional center for uh, intelligence training and also look towards the native community for an aboriginal training center for justice studies uh, for aboriginal people, which is a, an, an up and growing industry uh, throughout the country and something that's very well needed. Thank you. Audience members, this is your meeting, this is your council candidates here. Would you like to move to the next question or would you like to hear from the council candidates on this issue? Because I know this is an important one for some of you. How many would like to hear from the council candidates on this issue? Okay, if it's okay, we'll come back to that and move on to the next question. This is an interesting one. This is for the incumbents. For those that voted for their own raise, please justify it. <laughs> if you have any comments you'd like to ask a question, folks, uh, who would like to start with that one? Sure. Okay, Morrison. Sure, why not? First of all, I think we're all adults here. We're able to have a professional conversation about the value of your counsel. Um, first to point out, currently council gets paid peanuts. After the next election, the next council is also going to be paid peanuts. The mayor, we all know the amount of work she's done. She's been making $34,000 a year. Going up against people like Dean Ford and Frank Leonard at CRD meetings who are making close to $100,000 a year. We know what the value of our council is. We're not talking about big, giant raises. We're not talking the amount of money that an MLA or an MP makes. We're talking a small fraction of that. But the amount of work that we do is just as valuable. So if we want to make you know, silliness and have uh, throw mud at each other about how much money a councillor gets paid or the mayor gets paid, really I think we're a lot more mature than that. I think we're a lot more focused on a more important future for Swamil than what the next councillor is going to be paid. Policy says Granville councillors will get 40% of what the mayor gets. So, as a community as a whole, we had these all broken down into sectors. Everybody voted differently. When it came to the regular meetings, staff took and put it all into one lump sum. So, that made everybody look like they were totally greedy, but nobody looked at the policy. If we have to change the policy, then let's change the policy. But don't criticize us because we followed the policy. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, thank you. I voted in favor of the, the pay increase, if we may call it that. And my reasoning was to make it more accessible. That no matter what economic income bracket the person was in, they would be able to run for council. For example, if uh, somebody was working at a job that they couldn't get away from, but if the council pays a certain amount, they can maybe go on part-time and then also be a counselor. So that way, with the wage being what it is now or what it will be when the election is over, we'll offer a, an economic incentive that will make it easier for people to run for council. And that was my intent of supporting the motion. one because there were a number of motions that were brought forward. Initially what we did is we went out to the community and, and formed a community group that were to come back in, in terms of evaluating council uh, wages uh, in relation to other communities uh, that of like size. And we did that uh, and the recommendation came back for a, an increase for both mayor and council. And I supported that based on the recommendation and the work that had been done by the committee. There were then follow-up motions that added changes to the uh, wages for council. And I will say that I did not support any of the follow-up motions. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Somebody in the audience would like to ask a question? Please raise your hand. Adrian will find you while I am reading this. Right there. I'm going to paraphrase this slightly differently from the writer, just so it gives everybody a shot at this one, because I think this is probably 
the baby. Uh, of the night, the issue. Please tell us what steps you would take to get us to a solution for sewage in this community. Let's start down at the far end. Right. What steps would you take to get us to a solution in sewage treatment? Well, Your Honor. Well, until I read up on all the secret meetings that this council has had on the sewer treatment plan and get up online with it, I just saw what I read in the paper. And I read the paper. We don't have a problem because it's not going into a sky mall. So until I get more information and allow to see it, I don't really know what we can do. We would um, know we'd have to wait until the CRE is going to do next. It's a balls in their court. Thank you. And again, we understand this is a very important issue, but gravity is really of value tonight. So I firmly believe the CRD has gone down the wrong path and that McLaughlin and Macaulay are off the table. But we need to continue down the path of looking at what we're going to do with our sewage treatment. Integrated resource management and a distributed model is the most ideal way to proceed because we need a system that is both forward thinking and financially sound. It's better to do it right the first time. Integrated resource management is not new technology. It is technology that could keep this project from becoming a total mess. We need to continue to be vocal and work with the other communities to find a new path forward. Options and concepts that fit the needs of the communities. There are some outstanding sewage treatment plants developed worldwide. Ones with newer technology, better price tags, and, with, and we need to continue to work collaboratively to find our solution. One of the benefits of being a Swano resident, there's probably nobody else in this region, in any other community, that knows more about sewage treatment than we do. We have had to experience quite, a, quite an interesting last few years, actually the past decade, decade has been going on for quite some time, starting with Macaulay Point before McLaughlin Point. And then let's not forget about Newfield uh, Road as well, that's that one that we purchased with our tax dollars, $17 million, so many assessed value as well. And now we're stuck with that as taxpayers. But what we have in our favor is what I'm trying to say is that we know all of the, the, all the technology that the CRD refused to look at. You cannot fool us on that. And we not only uh, educate ourselves, but we've helped people across the region and hopefully help the media as well understand the technology that we should be should have been exploring from day one. We get to restart. The provincial government has, we have the support of the provincial government in doing that restart. And let me just say something about the in-camera meetings. The reason why we're in-camera is because it's legal strategy against the CRD. That's why we won. We don't want them to know our strategy, uh, Rod. So that's why it's so important to keep that conversation. Thank you for the question. Uh, so I am aware that there is a Westside Mayor's group that is part of, uh, that will be part of CRD. So the first thing that needs to happen is it needs to be approved by CRD going forward and also their terms of reference. This is a group that works together and should work together. I believe that it needs to be done in a collaborative fashion. We need to have a plan that moves forward and I would like to see that community consultation is at the top of the list. We need to determine exactly what it is that people want or don't want. So if it's not to be done in the middle somewhere, then you know what are we looking for? Is it odor free, noise free? Um, that it's going to expand. We have a lot of questions to ask and to have answered. I think it's important that we find out what it is we want to determine the kind of technology we want. And then when we find the technology that we want to determine what is needed, we need to find a site. There needs to be a proper process going forward and I'm prepared to see that go forward and let it happen uh, and I'm going to help it happen. Thank you. Uh, so I guess you could say my candidacy was born of sewage. Um, in 2007, it appeared that we would have a sewage treatment plant just a couple hundred meters from uh, our beautiful South Point neighborhood. And ever since then, I have pretty much been ceaselessly and tirelessly fighting on behalf of all of us to get a better plan for the region. Um, and finally, three weeks ago, the CRD granted permission 
for the core municipalities to explore a sub-regional partnering um, plan going forward. So this is a, a victory after seven hard years. And take a moment to clap your hands because you were a big part of that. <laughs> um, so what that means is going forward, you guys need to be involved because the reason we are in this mess is because the CRD never, ever, ever included the citizens in this process. You will be involved, I promise. Thank you. Um, I'll get some points by agreement. Pretty much everyone, everyone's set up till now. Uh, Beth and I go way back to the beginning of the day and uh, dealing with food treatment. It has affected us quite well. Um, I believe the West Shore group uh, and the solutions being put together by those mayors and councils from those areas are going in the right direction. Uh, I believe, as long as what Megan said, resource recovery is an important part of any sewage treatment plan. The concept of wastewater is a bad concept. We need to recover the energy and resources that are found in the airport. Um, distributed systems, smaller, closer to where the energy can be used is an important consideration. The district heat loops can be created, and in our town would be very handy to be able to take some of the energy harness off of the treatment to look at the heating and lighting of our civic structures like Archie Browning, the curling rink, the pool, and a town hall, and eventually the, visual, the, the Esquimalt Village Core Project for all benefits and those resources. Thank you. The West Side mayors have been meeting, uh, as well as West Side staff, and that includes everything from uh, Langford to Esquimalt. Uh, for the last three months, we have managed to make changes at CRD to allow a select committee to occur. That maintains the federal and the provincial funding agreements so that we can go forward and look for a solution on the west side. The uh, process is rolling out. We have a meeting tomorrow, actually, while all of you are working on the election. We're continuing to work and move forward. That will uh, bring forward the terms of reference. Uh, um, Beth is right, we have to have it passed by CRD next week, but we can continue to move forward. And the first part is public engagement. Instead of doing it like CRD did, which is saying you will have it, you are a part of it. What do you need to allow a sewage treatment plant in your community? What are the resources you want to, to see happen? Does it need to be buried? From there, we will go to technology and to siting, uh, and by March, you, we should have a sense of where we're going. Thank you. I am your billion dollar man. Science does not require this sewage treatment. Our current system works just fine. It pushes 99% water out into the deep waters of our ocean and is treated just fine. The University of Washington, the University of Victoria, Dr. Warburton, Dr. Keith Martin, our beloved MP, and David Anderson stated quite clearly almost nine years ago, this is not required. What we have here is a battle between optics and reality. And if we fight together as a city to stop the federal and provincial counterparts, which are just people like me standing up at a table trying to convince all of you that I'm right, if we can convince them that science is right, then we can stop this nonsense and stop the one billion dollar plan. Thank you, John. Uh, what we have to reflect on is what this is costing us as we remain stopped at the start line waiting to move forward. The meter is running through all of this. There's, there is no land being offered up. There is no land uh, being contemplated in any of these plans so far. We've had difficulty that you have all experienced uh, to get to one site. We need to contemplate what that is going to look like and we move on to look at 15 to 30 potential distributed sites. Always bear in mind the cost of planning and consulting because the meter is running and we do not want to waste the money that we have spent on this so far. There is a solution out there, but until we get offered up the land, we cannot have a meaningful discussion. John? Is this one? Okay. Um, 
Um, I agree with Scott. What goes out there is 99% water, and he failed to mention our Dr. Sean Peck from the University of Victoria. The, a lot of candidates will talk about we need to save the funding from provincial and federal funding. Well, who pays federal taxes? You do. Who pays provincial tax taxes? Oh, that's you too. Now, who pays the municipal taxes? So, it's not a deal when you take $500 from your left pocket, $500 from your right pocket, and $500 from your back pocket, and throw good money down the toilet when we don't have a sewage problem, we have a perception problem. Science says we don't need it, and I can't afford $500 a year plus. It's only, it's only going to go up. Next, next it'll be 1000 then 2000 How much will it take before we have people stand up and say no? Thanks, John. I'll say no. You've already brought the question to the public. We had four sessions, public hearings, to listen to the public that we would answer the CRD. Now we need the information to show us, are we right or are we wrong? If we're right, then let's leave the situation right where it is. It's not doing any harm. If it isn't right, then tell the public what it has to be done to make it right. All we keep hearing is dollars, dollars, dollars. Just like some of the other candidates have said, money's coming out of our pocket. We don't have that kind of money to throw around. These municipal people who are hardworking in the squabble, they want to keep their money. So let's do the job right. Let's get the information out there before we start making a plan. And let the people make the decision first. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, so, I guess I'll start out by saying that uh, I, I support council and the residents when they said no to both sites. Uh, and I agree that now we need to look at solutions. The series has formed by some of the candidates here said um, a committee for West Side uh, Municipality. Uh, and I would like to see a conceptual map result out of that committee and also any recommendations that can move forward as a result. Um, I would also like to see the possibility and the cost of a tertiary treatment plan as well as a decentralized plan. And the reason why I want to see numbers on the tertiary treatment is because uh, the pharmaceuticals and the chemicals are the most hazardous uh, toxins in, in the water and I would like to see um, cost estimates on how much that's going to be. And uh, I, what we do need to make sure is that the process is going to be public uh, and uh, open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My vision after what I heard to uh, Tim to Radio with the uh, public meeting and uh, in fact to all of the public meetings, I came away with the idea, with the, the thought that the public is right. We did not want that on our on our waterfront. But what I also heard loud and clear was that there are other options out there available to us. They all come with a different price tag, but the commitment I would make, and the uh, commitment that I believe that the future council will make, is to make sure that all of those options are presented, and that all of those options have an opportunity for the public to speak on them. And I think that's what's important. If nothing else, the last set of public hearings we had identified that there are different types of systems that are available out there. Those are the things that we need to have brought forward. We need to still work on finding a site, and I know we'll be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I grew up in a family hearing about wastewater treatment because my dad is an engineer who designs on-site sewage treatment systems. And there's a few things that I learned about that. I'm going to echo the uh, approach integrated resource management and the fact that the West Side mayors are on this, which is great. The things we need to know, we need to manage our source. So we need to know exactly what is in our wastewater that is of concern. What is the concentration of pharmaceuticals? And specifically, which ones are we trying to treat? Because the treatment technology that we choose Will, de will depend 
on what it is we're treating. The other thing we need to manage is the amount of flow that's coming in. We have stormwater coming into our sewer system. We need to address that so we're not building more plants than we need. Once we've got those things answered, we need to make information about the alternatives readily available to the public so they can be guided by expertise and evidence. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I agree with many of the candidates here that the, uh, the solution with the west side there uh, is something we should go forward with. We should start planning something that will solve the issue. We should not leave it up to the CRD and we should not try to simply go it alone or say we're not going to do it at all. That being said, we do also need the research to know exactly what we do need. And we should pick the best long-term option, not the cheapest, quickest fix. What are we going to need now? What are we going to need when the plant is finally built? And what are we going to need 20 years later when the plant is still operational? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's a long point on this. The short form. This is really tough. Can any of you envision a circumstance under which a regional sewage treatment plant at the Rockland Point would be acceptable? Anyone? Can any of you envision a circumstance in which the regional sewage treatment plant at the Rockland Point would be acceptable? Okay, so a completely different writer, but they are of a similar line. Is anyone here willing to stand up and say here and now that it would be completely unacceptable to have sewage treated in the Esquimalt Village Court? Anyone here willing to say that? Yes. John Ducker, Scott Eftel, and Josh Shepard. Okay, we'll move on to that third. Good evening, uh, Hans Farland. Uh, I like the format of the uh, raising hands. It's uh, I'm the inefficient. Just like uh, to find out where each candidate uh, stands on the issue of amalgamation. And so, if you are in favor of amalgamation, please raise your hand. <laughs> Let me reframe that because that's such a thorny one. But I understand. How many candidates here? are in favor of a study of the pros and cons of some amount of amalgamation in Greater Victoria. <laughs> How many are opposed to spending any money on a study of the pros and cons? Got out. Does that get to what you want? Okay. Next question here. This is interesting. Candidates, this involves an answer by numbers. How many letters to the editor have you written to protest the CRD's sewage debacle? Has anybody written letters to the editor? Can you show us my fingers? Three for Susan. <laughs> oh, one for David Schindlein. Barb? You want op-ed? Uh, op-ed, I guess, would be included. Yes, okay, four. Scott has got five. <coughs> Beth has got five. Ten for Tim. <laughs> Did I miss anybody? Okay, thank you. Questions? How many audience? Okay. Questions, sir. Uh, this question is for uh, If you were elected uh, councillor of the Squamal, what would you do proactively to protect our precious and beautiful Squamal coastline from the immense expansion of tanker traffic that would ensue from Kinder Morgan to Trans Mountain Pipeline? The, 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 the tanker traffic would increase from 80 tankers a year to over 444 tankers, right along in front of us. Before you answer, answer candidates, why don't we be fair? Why don't we start this one with Beth down there and work our way down to be fair? I have five variations on that question that are coming to the question jar. Thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, so the first thing I do is make sure we reaffirm our commitment to, that we did in 2012 to not increasing tanker traffic. And I think it's specifically at the municipal level, we need to partner with all the coastal municipalities and communities and band together and then force the issue at the UBCM and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities because that's where our strength is as a collective group of coastal communities. Thank you. Thank you. So in fact, the uh, council did say no tankers, uh, 2010, or uh, whatever year it was. Uh, but uh, we do need to affirm that, and, and it would be good to hear from the public. But I also feel personally, um, I don't want to see any or any more. 
Uh, however, uh, we need some others to come with us along that road, so we should then put out letters to other municipalities asking them to support and including um, our local capital region and then to the uh, Association of Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities. So we need to do it, and now that needs to forward then to the Union of these Municipalities. We need to have a joint, a joint uh, request, please, uh, so that that not happen. We need numbers in order to make our point known. Thank you. Um, so there were a lot of us here concerned that the probably one of the more powerful lobby groups in this country, the province, is big oil and, and uh, big industry. But I'll tell you, as others have mentioned, the biggest lobby group in this province and this country is the Union of British Columbia Municipalities in BC and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. That represents every single community, every single local government in this country and in this province. And I'll tell you, if you're Christy Clark or you're Stephen Harper, you do not want to piss off those organizations. You want to listen to those organizations. And it's us, it's quite well passing our motion, and every other community doing the same thing. What we ought to be really careful on is not to make this a rural urban strip. That's a real dangerous road to go down to, because if the rural resource community says that this is something the urban communities are forcing on them, it's going to be a divide and conquer situation for big oil and big industry. We have to work, as others have said, to partner up with other communities to get them to the place where we all understand it's in our best interest, in our environment's best interest, in our land and water's best interest to protect what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's not much more to add. I mean, the first few have already said most, but we need to continue to have a collective voice with our higher, our, our, our larger associations of municipalities. But one thing that scares me the most is the fact that even with our current tanker traffic, they took away the oil spill response station in Vancouver. So adding more to it is only a catastrophic event waiting to happen. So not only do we need to lobby to not expand, but we need to bring back that spill response station. I'm in a bit of a dilemma because I drive a car and I need gasoline. So, let's stop all the tankers going everywhere else except one that's going to bring my gas. <laughs> and that's what I'm asking everybody. It's a federal problem. Make sure we've got people trained to clean up the spill that's inevitably going to come. But please, have an answer. I really trust the gentleman that asked the question walked here tonight because I hope he didn't use any of my gas. Thank you, Rod. Thank you. Good evening, thanks. Uh, for taking our coastline, I've spoken at the Enbridge uh, Pipeline hearing. I was witness to the National Energy Board. Uh, I've been at this um, uh, all my life. Uh, these, these, these tankers and the lack of spill response uh, when moved from the west coast, principally Vancouver area, uh, we have to look at correcting that. It should be local. What we have to also realize is that should an accident occur and there's spillage on the shores of Esquimalt, well, our local resources are taxed first. They're the ones who are going to have to go in and do the first cleanup to have to pay first. So ultimately, it's got our own best interest. We work together and we need to realistically engage local First Nations, so as to ensure that they're involved in this process too, because they have as big a risk or greater because their food supply and their lifestyles are at risk during all the Thank you. Brenda, I'm going to start at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is above my knowledge. I really don't have enough, uh, enough information or enough knowledge to make a good statement here, but I do agree with most of what, what Council has been saying, and I will look into it further and research it more on my own, so that I can understand the issue and what we can do at the local level. Thanks for the record. Hi there, I am concerned with the statements about the UDCM. I think we can go a little bit further. We can uh, pass a motion, an agreement in principle to stand with the First Nations who are going to be fighting the passage of those pipelines through their traditional territories. Um, um, I think the other thing that we can do proactively as a council and a community is to teach people to be community activists. We have low voter turnout and that makes a difference because 
The people making decisions don't think we care. So we can start at the community level by engaging all of you, by engaging our young people, and teaching them how to get together and organize to make their message felt, not just municipally, but provincially and federally as well. So we can start a generation of revolutionaries right here in this final. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I must be honest, I'm in a bit of a quandary on this issue. On one hand, I look at it, and there's the whole big economic thing about you know, benefiting the country and everything. On the other hand, there's dealing with the environment. I'm 100% behind that we have to get a better spill response, whether it's one ship or 400 ships. That still needs to be dealt with. Uh, the tanker going loose off our coast just the other couple of weeks ago was a definite case in point that that's what we need to focus on. From the municipal level, I do believe that if there's strong support from the community and the community wants our council to take a stand on it, I'm very prepared to support that because that is what our community wants. But as an individual, I do find it a little difficult because there's still a lot of issues just like dealing with sewage problem. That took two years of listening to that. I would need to know a bit more before I made a firm decision. Thank you. I stand firmly against the increase of uh, tanker traffic. In 2010, the Squamal Council passed a motion uh, to ban the increase of tanker traffic, and I support this, this motion. And it was followed by the Union of BC Municipalities. They passed a resolution uh, very similar to the one that was passed in Squamal. So um, I echo what other candidates have said that we need to uh, be strengthened in numbers and we need to stand strong against the and other municipalities uh, to continue our opposition to the increase of tanker traffic and also stand with First Nations. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's much more we can say if any candidates haven't already said. Um, we need to reconfirm. Is there a still solution in place? And if not, who is putting it together? Is it the federal or the provincial government? Because if it's a squamo, it's our tax dollars, and we have such a pristine coast that we can't afford to lose that gym. I've been here for over 40 years, and I enjoy the squamo harbor and all the waterfronts, and I don't want to see it destroyed by some ship that cannot control its uh, destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. I like all of the, the platitudes that people are saying up here, mm -hmm. but realistically, a uh, municipal council cannot stop tanker traffic. Even the provincial government cannot stop tanker traffic. The only power that has, the only thing that has more power than big oil is international banking, and these two work hand in hand to destroy freedom and liberty. If you want to stop tanker traffic, stop buying stuff from Walmart, stop buying stuff from China, so that they need this energy to produce the crap to send to us. The solution lies with you. It doesn't lie with government. It relies with you voting with your dollars, buying local stuff that doesn't require oil to be shipped to China so that they can ship cheaply made plastic trinkets back to us. So looking to government to solve this and municipal council isn't going to solve the problem. You are going to solve the problem. Thank you, John.